I bow. Thank you, God. Yes, God. Praise God. Um, I have one verse from the scriptures in, in Matthew I want to read out. And I'll, I'll let um, 
a brother here to share. And it's the standard of, of how God, if, if, you ever, if you ever thought, what's the standard of a Christian or disciple to walk with Jesus? What, what's the standard? What, what's the, uh, I guess, the resume that we need to fit the description to walk with Jesus? And uh, in Matthew chapter 5, a few verses there, it tells us the standard, I guess, the, um, the walk that Jesus gives to all those uh, that actually recognize that you know, we are a follower of him. So let's just read together from um, chapter 5. There's a few verses that I want to read, about six verses in verse um, 2 onwards. And um, he opened his mouth. So if you are there, if you want to follow his pen, I'll, I'll just give you a few seconds. I'm going to stand up and read this. It's a beautiful benchmark for us to gauge whether we're in the, in the spirit, where we're walking with God. Are we walking with God? And I always read it, even this morning as we're praying, I read passages of it because there was a mentioning of um, some persecution some people were finding uh, when, they had, when they spoke boldly uh, for the Lord. There was always repercussions. And, um, and sometimes um, it wasn't pleasant, the things that were done to the prophets that spoke uh, you know, out. It happened, you know, you know, before us and still happening today, those who walk with God and, and our, our servants, um, you, you will, you know, persecuted. You'll be reviled, but, you know, for what, you know, for who you are and what you say. So, God, I thank you for this word. As I'm reading it, I pray that you just, um, you know, help us to listen and uh, with, with spiritual ears, with eyes of understanding to recognize, wow, there is actually a standard that you want us to, to recognize. If we are in this place with you, uh, Lord, these things must happen to us, and, and they are promises for your people, for your children, for your servants, God. Thank you, God. And he, and he opened his mouth in verse 2, and he said and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manners of evil against you falsely. For my name, for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets, which they were before you. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Who wants to read from verse 12? I'm sorry, 13, Venice. 13 to 16. Thank yeah. you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be secure? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's speak. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stream and it gives light to all in the hill. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and the glory to your Father who is in heaven. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Beautiful passage, isn't it? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> the Beatitudes, I, I believe it's beautiful if you want to remind yourself, um, you know, how am I going with the Lord and just recognize there's some things there for all of us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Brother Kevin. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And Blessing us with, yeah. Come on. SD, Sister D, yeah. thank you so much. Maybe if you want to come at the front, you can sit there. Or maybe so we can, yeah. yeah. Is it right? Okay. That way I'll just put the video on you so if people do, do come in, um, <laughs> you're going to praise God. Talk to people, you see? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> come into a room and look at the dynamics. Come on. <laughs> I got that from uh, uh, got that from twenty five years of street preaching. Yes, yeah. and uh, you, you, you you learn. We we would we would go we would we would go into uh, towns 
and um hey christina and She's and you could you could tell i could tell through experience learning um whether people would listen or people wouldn't listen my wife never could you see you know and uh and, and that and that would just be by just looking at the the spiritual weather you know mm. and uh but we are called to to preach the gospel in season and out of season so you never know mm. sometimes either you know mm. and uh but god will god will show me um the open windows you know yeah and uh when Australians would listen and when Australians wouldn't listen. Mm. Yeah. 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 And it was it was the same with the cross. There'd be particular days I'd have a lot of success and other days I'd have a blast through, you see, you know, because the Lord was in it. And uh and so uh, my foundation scripture here and uh thanks to um it's Ephesians there, you know. God gave the gift to the evangelist yeah. to equip the church for the work of the ministry. And um, so you invited an evangelist here, so you got to get an evangelistic <laughs> message. <laughs> so, you know, you cover something else you from me. Go next door, you leave one there. Well, hang on. Not expect did, didn't you go yeah, next door? Yeah, I did. Yeah, he's not expecting you, but he maybe is. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll be praying for you. Uh, <laughs> Amen. Yeah. yeah. Well, outside my caravan, I have a, a big gospel, but bit like you got there. So I've got my story on it. I thought I'd be a bit more blunt and a bit more let people know exactly what my story was. And it cost 600 bucks to get it done. So that's serious money. <laughs> well, you don't really have it for those sorts of things. And uh, but money's never, I've never let money stop me getting the story out. You know? So it's a great big, it's a great big gospel sign, you see, on on, on a tin. And um, and I know that when they when when they've done the, the story on there, um, they, they quickly gave it back to me. <laughs> the guy was carrying it out out there, right? And uh, but you know it's quite funny because I was out the uh, I was out in the outbacks one time and stopped in a uh, truck stop. Those uh, overnight ones, you know, back in nowhere, toilet block, you know, and a Sort of a toilet there, yeah. and I put my I put my uh, message out there, and I, I've got to tell you this, praise God, because the Lord's telling me to tell you anyway. And um, I waited because you're fishing, you see, you know. We're fishing for people. That's why you oh, go and do what you do, you see. We're, we're fishers, you see. So yeah. my story is, is is the bait, you see, you know. So I thrash it, you see, you know. And uh, you know, um, so um, the first person came across was Sid Davis. <laughs> you got all sorts in caravan parks. A seven day Venice came over, you know, and he came over there and he uh, knocked on my door and we had a bit of fellowship. Praise God for the seven day Venice. Man. I've been that hard up to fellowship, but the only crowd I could get to be encouraged, you know. Mm. I've gone to home fellowship meetings, knocked on the door, and in a block of ice and a human forms met me, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Who are you? How did you know we were here? <laughs> says, I got the computer. I know you've got a Bible study tonight. Can I come in? Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So anyway, we, we bypassed the, 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 the Sabbath keeping law, you know, which they're into. And he was really happy, went away. Well, about five minutes later, another knock on door. <laughs> this, this was a South African. Uh, Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> no, I love South Africans. They, they play rugby, you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's my connection with South Africa's rugby. Okay, because I'm a Kiwi, you see. You know, so yeah, they play in heaven, by the way. Have you found nothing else up there? You know, the nation. <laughs> anyway, he came over, so he had his guns drawn. He's a J Dub. You know, I'm Pentecostal. He's ready to blast away. So we had some intense fellowship, kind of. And my wife came out for reinforcements because she could hear us getting louder because I'm loud, you see. <laughs> anyway, we managed to arrest the bro. 
and uh, he went away, and uh, he was quite happy. He, he, he dumped his stuff on me, you see. You know, that was his way of evangelizing. Dump the J-Dub message on you. So went back into the van. Then <laughs> the third person came over. They were at a road stop. So there's an anointing. God's doing stuff. Hallelujah. And, um, well, he was a, an Aboriginal man who was an ex-Christian, had left his Christianity because of the white missions that came and slaughtered the race. And uh, he had become a, uh, a, a Muslim. So his God was Allah. So I thought, this is just amazing, you know. I've got split. But he was really nice. But he was sussing me out. He wanted me to know that Allah loves me. <laughs> and he really was reinforcing it that Allah loved, loved me. And I thought, oh. So anyway, we had a bit of, bit of a talk there. He was attracted to my sign, you see, you know. Probably come out of an alcohol background, you see, you know. He went away, went back in the caravan, and then, <laughs> well, the Aboriginal brother, man, came back. I thought he's come back again for another shot at me. You know? <laughs> and he handed me $200. He said to me, here, bro brother, just want you to know that Allah loves you. Wow. <laughs> 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 it's a true story, you know. And I got millions of those stories. I collect them, you know. And uh, and it's never happened that way again, you see, you know. I took the two hundred dollars. There was some petrol money. The Bible says he'll he will uh, he will. Um, there's no shortage of money. It's in the wrong hands. <laughs> it's this. There's no shortage of money. It can be a shortage of faith, though. It takes oh. faith to get the stuff. Yeah. It takes faith. Hallelujah. So um, into my story, praise God. I love the church. I love the whole lot of them. Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians, SDAs. I carry the world in my heart. Hallelujah. Yeah. I carry the world in my heart there, yeah. praise God. Yeah. But you can't win everybody. Mm. You got to fish where Father God tells you to go to. Yeah. We launched, we came into Australia 30 years ago and started preaching down there in Surface Paradise. So we were street preaching 30 years ago, Friday, Saturday nights, with the 30, 30 year ago generation that was down there. Mm. <laughs> Rocked into the Brisbane Mall, stood there, no street preacher. Father God says, go to Mighty 10 and buy a step ladder and start meetings in the Brisbane Mall. So I bought a 12-foot step ladder, praise God, went down there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at lunchtime. Got lunchtime crowds, hallelujah. And started opening their meetings, praise God. And hundreds and hundreds of people got to hear my story, hallelujah. Amen. So I'm always stirring Christians up. To stir your story up, hallelujah. We'll always argue with what denomination or abomination you're, you're hanging out with out there. You know, but the Bible says there, the Bible, the Bible says there that, uh, it does say it really, that, that a man with an, an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. In all the years I've been evangelized, I've never had one person argue with my story. No one. 25 years of street preaching, not one. The opposite. The opposite. The opposite. So the key to open air ministry is your testimony, is your story. Hallelujah. We overcome the devil by the blood of the land and the word of your testimony. Hallelujah. And you've got a story here. Who you are, what you are. Where you come from, you got a story to tell. Right. The key is to practice giving it. Yeah. Practice yeah. it. Yeah. Practice yeah. it. Practice. A lot of Christians yeah. don't do that out there. So when you throw them out there, they can they can <laughs> they get into trouble, you see. You know. So you practice it. It's the only story you got anyway. Yeah. What Jesus Christ done for you. Hallelujah. We're all amazing grace and here, praise God. Amen. Yeah. So in some ways it was easy for me because I was right out there in the dark world. There's an old son, he that's lost much, loves much. Yeah. But we've all lost much yeah. until you find Christ. Amen. Amen. So you've got to stir Amen. that part up also. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Um, I'm a big believer in body parts. Find your body parts. What are you? You know, what's what, what part do you flow in the body of Christ? We are a body. The reason a lot of messed up believers around because they haven't recognized what their body part is. There's something that you're very good at doing. Hallelujah. Because that's the way God made you. Amen. Oh, he made God. you a certain way. Hallelujah. Amen. I left my employment after two years of being saved to prove the call of the evangelist. Okay. Hallelujah. And I'll rave on a bit about it, praise God, because so few people know anything about it. And the church lacks uh, teaching on that ministry gift. They don't even know what one, what one is. You see. Mm. Amen. So I've been saved two years. And, uh, and wherever I went, Father God said, I've called you to be a ministry gift of a, an evangelist. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I studied the gift out there, and it's a mobile ministry. It goes and it travels out and ministers out there. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And I'm not a pastor. I'm not a local church. I tried that many years ago, and I was a pastor from hell, mate. <laughs> Just been straight with you, you know. I set up a little church out there, and I knew who was going to come to my church, people like me, and they did turn up. Boy, all the old rat bags, mate, and Logan come along out there, you know. And I called, and, and I had a true story. And I called my church Going Straight Christian Fellowship 25 years ago. And I hated every minute of it. I hate, I didn't like them and they didn't like me. That's not good foundation to have, you know. But anyway, um, the reason being, because it was an Ishmael and not an Isaac. Yeah. It was a work of the flesh, not, a, not an Isaac job. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And I had a halfway house going. I was doing prison ministry. And, and because of my background, I, I God heavily uses me, makes me own kind out there. But it doesn't make me a pastor. Just because you're good at looking after a group doesn't make you a pastor, you see. You've got to get a thus saith the Lord and amen. If you don't, flag it, mate. Oh, Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. That's good. Hallelujah. If you don't, get an amen, flag it. Find out what it is he wants you doing. Hallelujah. Amen. So I came out of the prison world, so I'm extreme and, uh, and difficult. Someone said that to me, Kevin, you're a very difficult person. I thought, well, that's cool. <laughs> Probably am. I've been difficult all my life, you see, because I was seriously abused. You see? Hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Amen, you see. And, uh, and so when you've been locked up in seven New Zealand prisons, nearly six years in punishment cells, Fighting screws, lighting fires, escaping, bashing people, bashing coppers, mate. That whole world out there, you know, you've got some issues in your life, you see. When you're locked up in those places out there, uh, there's only three real lonely places. One's when, when, you, when someone dies, two's divorce, and three's a punishment cell. You know, on, on, the, rit rit on the scale out there, you see, you know. And, uh, and so um, I can tell you jail stories all day and make you sad, mad, you know, and a couple of ways make you glad, you see, you know. And, uh, but someone did say to me, you're a difficult person. And I really thought about that for a while. And, then I, and, and you know, they were right. <laughs> hey, man, I can be difficult, you see. And, uh, but anyway, I'm getting better and better and better and better, as we all are. Hey, yeah, man. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's where I've been difficult as long as that, there's some change happening there, you know. I deal with a lot of difficult people. And one guy on the phone the other day to me, extremely difficult, you know. And uh, so I give it to my wife now to talk to you. See, because I'm a one shot. Get the mess. I get it. Don't bug me. Uh, that's not good pastoring, you see. In fact, I sent him to his pastor. I contacted his pastor out there, and they know him anyway. But he still run me up again, you see. You know, they stop. They stop too. You know, oh, Lord. You know, but anyway, uh, broken home. All my stuff. My father was a uh, had three and a half years in German prison war camps. So he was in the war, and uh, I was thinking about how many lives Hitler destroyed. Didn't just you know kill people out there in the battlefield. He destroyed families right across the world. Because you know? our father, our grandfathers, had to come home. You know? And my father came home, his first wife died when he's in the trenches fighting the Italians, you know. And he had to kill the Italians, bayonets. 
And he said to me, the Italians would hold up pictures of Mary and plead for mercy, but were ordered to kill them. Italians, they say, Catholic. You know? That's what they did. You know? They said we had to kill them, you see. You know? So you get a little picture of what my father was like, not begging him, not knocking him, just explaining to you uh, where my dysfunction came from. So my father came back to a dead wife and uh, picked up his three children, other three children he had, and then he met my mother, one of 10, 10 children on a farm, and uh, he had eight children, worked on the railways. Uh, they had nothing what people have today, back in those days. You were just sent to work, <laughs> eight children, you see, you know. So um, in that generation out there, my, my, my father was unable to communicate. There was, I mean, we lived in, a, in, a, in what you call a, a state house, you see, you know. And there was none of, none of the niceties that people have today, you know. <laughs> you know, didn't even have a shower, had a bath. It was just recycled water. <laughs> and I thought about that one day, that there's no shower there. There was a bath, so you filled the bath up and to save the water, the next one got in there, and then the next one, then the next one, you see. And that was normal, you see. Black, dark brown water, you see. You know? And uh, little observation, you see. You know? And I could tell you many 1950, 60 stories, you know, and uh, uh, of, of what it was like, you see. You know? So my father terrorised my mother, and my mother tried to do her best, but they didn't have Jesus. You know, there was a Bible up there, but it was in, uh, got dust on it, you know, <laughs> a dusty Bible, is it? So um, my father really terrorised the family, you know, and uh, I could tell you some really terrible stories of what went on. And uh, But I hated home. I wanted my mother, mother and father dead at the age of 11, you see. I used to pray God kill them, you see, you know, at 11 years of age, you see. I was a Catholic, you see. Went to mass every Sunday, you see. Right? So we're all broken, we're all busted, we're all messed up, we all wanted to leave home. And so when it came to getting married, we all had major issues. <laughs> and I got I got a million marriage stories, and sometimes I divert over there because uh, a lot of people don't talk about it, you see, you know, and, and, and you can't really help people much, you know, if you don't have some marriage testimonies because the Lord restores. That's We've been right. together, my wife and I have been yeah. together um, 36 years, you know. Wow. And, uh, but it does say for better or worse, you see. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife married an evangelist, but also a very difficult person, you see, you know. And it's not till you live together that you find out, you know, who you really are, you see, oh, you know, as, you, as, as you all know that, you see, you know. And, uh, and so I was, I was ill prepared for marriage whatsoever, you know, because my way of dealing with any problems was chuck you out on the lawn. Serious. <laughs> oh, I would do it. I'd just pick you up and open up the door, throw you on the lawn, you know, shut the door and go to bed and say, you know, when you change your ways, you can come back to bed. Get <laughs> <laughs> some ideas here. Oh, we can laugh about it, we at the time, it wasn't funny. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you see, because that was the world I grew up in. Mm -hmm. You see, you, you don't know anything different, you see. You know? And I've been in boys' homes. You know, I was made to scrub like, you're not pumices. I, I put a tattoo on my arm when I was a kid, and this rotten drag bag of a welfare worker, Boy, I'll tell you what, you know, and, uh, you know, I didn't want this woman one bit, mate. You should maybe get some pumice and scrub me out like that. Yeah, like that. Big boils come up on my arms, you see. So that was the treatment of how things were back in those days in welfare homes, you see. Lots change, cameras, you see. So pretty well watch what you can do. Back in my, no cameras, you see. And a lot of the people that worked in that, a lot of people who worked and institutions in those days that had come out of the war. You see? A lot of them were English pommies, very authoritarian, you see. 
they got out of the army so they get jobs as screws and prison wardens and wealthy workers that they, they, they bring in their tactics like sleep deprivation okay you know what sleep deprivation is sleep deprivation is when they get you they sit you down in a seat down there you sit there they sit and look at you like that you know and force you to stay awake okay. and when you go to sleep they bash you in the head like that and bash you again see and i was bashed you see you know that's an old war tactic you see you know and there's a lot of others too you see cat nine tails bash you see you know abuse you see so you've got to understand the the era that, that, that i grew up in you see you wouldn't get away with that today you see but back then they did you know uh sexual abuse you know, all that stuff out there you know you, you look at men people have been busted for uh you know kids and stuff you know and they're in their 70s and 80s you see so it was why but well, this stuff was going on you see you know because people just went out and done it and didn't care you see because there, no, there was no accountability nothing you see okay so that's what so uh on the streets doing a street kid gang Call ourselves the devils of cycles. There you go. <laughs> I really wanted to connect. Um, but God's just a little waster, you know, and uh, birds and feather flock together. And um, so, boys, I just broke out of a boy's home one day, nearly killed the guy. Had he died, I wouldn't have cared, you know, didn't care, you know. And so, um, 15 years of age, Borstal. Borstal's an old. Turn for like juvenile like youth, like, 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 like a youth prison, you know, for kids. And uh, so I wound up in Invercargill in this great big jail out there. Uh, walls, thick doors, peepholes, screws, uh, old school jail. Except we're all young. <laughs> so you, you know, it goes on in a, in a youth prison, you know, it's a tough world. So, um, the only thing I did well in life was play up. <laughs> Unless I was good at doing something, you know. My report cast here, when things aren't going Kevin's way, Kevin plays up, you see, you know. And uh, so I was pretty evil sort of a guy, you see, you know. And uh, so when you play up in those places, they lock you up in a concrete room. They take their mattress off you. You're left with a... No toilets in the cell of those days. It was buckets. See. No toilet, so a bucket in the corner, you know, it sits there all day. Get to empty it once a day, you see. A little baby's chamber pot, you know, and um, you, have to, you know, no pillows, two thin blankets, and that was it till night time. So, I'm just painting a picture for you 5 a.m. in the morning, you know, screws come along, and you know, up, get up, walk out to the door, take all your clothes off. Look at all your private parts, you know. That'll get you angry, you know. Straight away. You're 15 years of age. Put your back in your cell. Search your cell. Uh, you take your mattress out. Leave it out in the corridor out there. You're back in your cell. Slam the door in your face. Okay. So the only time you see people is when the, when, when the guys come around for your breakfast. Porridge on a tray. And then they come around again to get your dishes again. You know? And the only next time you see people is at lunchtime. And then you see uh, the screws are going about five o'clock. So um, I learned to construct my day. I'm pretty organised. I'm uh, pretty punctual, and um, and I, I can sit still for long periods of time. You see, and uh, but don't go to sleep. I've been working on that one reason being because uh, Samson went to sleep and he lost his he lost his anointing. Mm. Samson went to sleep and he lost his anointing. I heard that from an 81-year-old preacher in Rockhampton a few months ago, Claude Fingleton, one of my favourite preachers. 81 years of age, on fire for the Lord, but one of the best churches in Australia. You know, and uh, I just salute that guy because you, you never leave without learning something. So every time I go visit that church, I want to learn something. You know, that, that, that he got up and he said, he said, he said that, he says, Samson went to sleep. Got his hair cut, lost his anointing. Yeah. So, at 82, 81 years of age, you'd think you'd like a nap, wouldn't you? you see? <laughs> really, what he was saying, I was going to go home and have a sleep. And he says, No, I'm not going to go home and sleep. I'm going to get about the Lord's work. Come on. Amen. Yeah. That sort of preacher. 
<laughs> Amen. So I was an alcohol. I want you to know, hallelujah. <laughs> I don't drink. And wherever I go, I say to the church, I personally don't drink alcohol. The church is very quiet on alcohol, sad to say. Uh, anti alcohol sermons went out the door, I think, probably around the late 80s, early 90s. So I don't drink alcohol. Uh, and the reason I don't drink alcohol is because um, if I drink alcohol, then I don't have a witness for surface paradise. And uh, I've had many people uh, challenge me on the alcohol issue, Christians out there, and I say, well, um, when the drunk comes to your meeting with those issues, how are you going to help them? They're going to say, you, 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 you said that my life could be changed, you know. Do you drink, you see? Mm. You know, and whether you're a drunk or not a drunk, most are, you know, a lot are. The fact of the matter was, it blows out your, your witness, you see, you know. That's right. You know, real life, yeah. Exactly. Now, I've tried it, you see, okay. And uh, I, I, I had an eight-month uh, gap in my Christian walk where I wanted, I became what's called a... Uh, I, I became what's called a sipping saint. <laughs> okay. So being the determined person that I am, um, I thought, well, um, can I, as a new creature in Christ, touch alcohol? Okay. So anyway, I'll just short this one for you because I've got a few stories to tell. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Um you know what happened when I picked up drink after being sober a long time? Number one, I couldn't listen to gospel music. Wow. And I love mm. gospel music. I love music. Get around me. I've got a thousand dollar ghetto blast in the back of my red car there. I've got a battery in there, hooked up out there. And I turn that thing up full blast. So it bombs out everywhere. Okay? It's in here, okay? Hallelujah. And I've got it on a trolley, mate, okay? So if I really want to upset the devil, <laughs> I'll, dra I'll, dra I'll drag that thing down yeah. the highway, and I'm not frightened to either. Because okay? I like a loud hallelujah. Boom, because I've got some favourite music, praise God. That soon drowns out the devil, hallelujah, in the back of my youth there. A great big thing. Amen. Highly recommended, hallelujah. Which you get from a sad day to a glad day, hallelujah. And Jesus Christ can turn around your day, hallelujah. By plugging in the sounds, amen. And Gabriel there. Hi, you want evening? He, he loves light <laughs> evening. Okay. A couple of subwoofers. Yeah. Yeah, well, these are bigger than the subwoofers. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Okay, so uh, number one, I couldn't listen to gospel music conviction. Uh, number two, it messed up my AA ministry. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, which is my, one of my best fishing holes. Mm. Yeah, I've been preaching in AA now for 41 years, five months, and I'd highly recommend it for more Christians that would learn how to talk to addicted people to go in there because the meetings are on every night on the week out there, and they'll give you 10 minutes to talk. Wow. And if you have their story, praise God, they will listen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, they do discipleship better than the church does. Mm -hmm. Hello. AA do discipleship far better than the church does. Mm. Now, the only society that meets every night of the week and three times a day. Mm. They're the only society that meets every night of the week mm. and three times a day. Mm. The church doesn't. Okay. So you miss out because they only meet on a Sunday. There's nothing else on most of the time or in a certain smaller places, fat zero. Is that? Okay. And Alcoholics Anonymous came out of the. Uh, um, who? You can speak to. Yeah. <laughs> it came out of the Oxford movement, which was old time Christian message back 100 odd years ago. And it used to be called the James Club. And Alcoholics Anonymous studied the book of James. 
and they study the book of James because the book of James is 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 about cleaning your life up. That's right. Yeah. So every night of the week, I, Kevin, can go to an AA meeting and give a talk and be encouraged. And people talk my language. Mm -hmm. Amen. Are they off the rails? Definitely. Mm -hmm. It became philosophy. They, they, they moved Jesus out and put their God of the understanding. But it is out of the Bible. Step one, admit. Step two, came to believe. Step three, hand your life and will over the care of God as you understand them. Step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, all house cleaning stuff. Step 12, me. Step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other alcoholics and practice these principles, but all right, there's evangelism. You studied out for yourself the 12 sets out there, you see, you know. Amen. So we've moved away from a lot of that stuff, you see. Getting people to give their stories, telling your testimonies. That's how people get free. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Hallelujah. Hence evangelism. Hallelujah. And, and I'll turn to right now, praise God. And uh, why the devil attacks the evangelist, number one reason, he muzzles them. He, he, the Bible says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. So the church has muzzled that gift, stolen it, killed it. It doesn't matter how big the bull is, man. The way you, the way you drop the bull is, 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 is stop feeding the thing. Yeah. Okay. So. And the job of the evangelists will come into the body of Christ and remind the church of the lost and equip the church to tell their stories. Pastors can't really do that unless they get somebody in. Okay. Hence, when I tried to be a pastor, I failed because I was too direct, too evangelistic. My answer was evangelize. But a pastor, uh, a different role. They've got to clean the backside of the nose and all other kind of, which I've got time for that stuff, you see. So I'm the wrong person to be the pastor, you see. I'll say, get out there and give your testimony, you know. Well, they, they might. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I love the church. I love the whole lot. I'm just keeping it real. My passion is that ministry gift of the evangelist. Okay. Hallelujah. But you can't give away what you haven't done. That's right. Yeah. You can't give away. I just spent six months in the Kimberleys. Mm. I'm a rock oh. A long time ago, Father God said this to me. He said to me, son, this is how you're going to get direction. Listen to the still quiet voice behind the ear. This is this be the way. Walk ye in it. Yeah. He told me that when I was a young Christian. Listen to the still quiet voice. Still, still, still quiet voice. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, yeah. listen. That's why I'm successful in God. Yeah. But don't worry, yeah. I can get unsuccessful. Because I don't listen. I can have selective hearing like we all can. <laughs> yeah. So I'm big on honesty. I'm big on being real. Prison taught me that. When you go to jail, you can't leave, go to another jail while you can with the church. Yeah. You can church up all across. There's, I love them all. Hallelujah. I do. I, I, I love the church. Beautiful. But I'll tell you what, mate, they feed me. <laughs> they hear me. They, they, they look after us, praise God. Greatest family in the world. I love the whole. I don't care. I don't care. Just, I'll just tell you, see, yeah. <laughs> I've got a good relationship with the church. I've got a good relationship with hundreds of pastors. And if somebody has a problem with me, I say, I'll give the last 50 churches I've been to. I give the last 50 pastors I've been to, and please talk to them about what you don't like about me, and they'll inform me whether they're right or wrong. See, I'm talking relationship. You know? yeah, so I've got a good relationship with the yeah. body of Christ. I've worked at that. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because they've got a tougher job than me. Yeah. I can leave town. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 and the car came and picked up an half hour. Leave town. Praise God. <laughs> I look at you. Got a thousand times. Amen. <laughs> That's right. Amen. And I've done it. Yeah. But I learned this about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he has a rope on you, man. Yeah. You know, and you might be running somewhere and that rope gets tighter. 
Yeah, exactly, sister. Amen. He wore like the alcohol. You see, I woke up one day after eight months out there. Yeah, it messed up me AA. It, it, I didn't know how much you have. You're going to get put up by the police. My wife, my wife would do the driving. There you go. Bit of manipulation there. Uh, what else? Um, oh, some Christians looked in their nose at me, and uh, so I tested them out. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a group anyway. Uh, but the fact of the matter was, it was the fridge. I'd open up the fridge, and the cans of beer fall out looking for the milk. <laughs> oh, <my>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know. So it was an experiment. And I woke up one day, and God said to me, how's the experiment going, son? It was stupidity. Yeah. But sometimes the Lord lets you go back to Egypt. Mm. See? Wow. He says, you want another, you want another sniff of Egypt, then? <laughs> <laughs> the main difficulty, the main difficulty I had with the alcohol was in my day, there was two brands. Yeah, the cereal was two brands. Dominion Bitter and Waikato. And I rocked, I rocked into that bottle shop out there, and there was about, a, there was about 500 brands in there, and I thought, goodness me, I'm uncomfortable anyway, but I've just got more uncomfortable. Which one do I choose to have a sip? <laughs> anyway, I've never gone back to it. And I tell people that, you see. I've got nothing to hide, you know. Nothing. My ministry is built on the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, not on personality, not on how good I can do things because I can't. You know? So, um, nut houses, drugs, yeah, I used to shoot drugs up. I was a glue sniffer, petrol sniffer, I'd go to chemist shop. Back in the day, you could buy whole trays of active phenol, decongestant, and fentanyl, which has codeine phosphate. Codeine phosphate is an opiate out there, and opiates will get you stoned. So, we'd go there and get trays of Bring the stuff out there, get stoned, go to the pub, get drunk and stoned. You say, you've got to understand the world I came out of. I was just off my tree. I drank in gutter hotels with a mongrel mob, black power, filthy few, Satan slaves, crooks, burglars, that clientele. That was my family. <laughs> um, you, you got, I, and, I, and I ran with a, a pretty wicked crowd. But that was my world, you see, you know, because it's all about the alcohol. And all about the marijuana, all about scoring. You see, any, any phone call it was about scoring. Any place I went to, I mean, it was about scoring. I was at a Christian party last night. Everybody's off their tree made on Jesus. Was smashed around the place oh, yeah. out there. You know, and I, I sat back there and I thought, there's no weed, no pills, uh, no ACDC. If you were into that, I wasn't. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was nothing. Just Jesus, 40 people in a room, bigger than this one, no, no, no. and uh, just going for it, you know. And, uh, and the Holy Ghost was doing what he wanted to do. And, uh, you know, so, so that's the difference, you see. Okay. So I became what's called in my world a professional psychiatric patient. Um, Jack Nicholas, what's with the cookies there? See, so you saw that movie. Yeah, but I did. It's very good. So when I did top shelf, I'd go crazy, kick doors down, smash and grab off the tree, and so backs of ambulances, police cars, a whole lot. So but the fact of the matter was that uh, when I got when when when, when the alcohol or drugs out of my system, I am just like I am now, loud and forward, but not mad. Ooh. Okay, loud and forward, yeah, but not mad. You see. So what could they do? Medication, group therapy, group therapy, psychodramas, wires on your head, uh, padded cells, the whole lot. I was literally <coughs> in dozens of mental wards, okay? I was, you know. So when I got out, I'd get into it all again. So when I got rid of the grog, I solved 95% of all my problems. What a message. Praise God. I mean, you're alive. You know. I solved 95% of all my issues just by removing the alcohol. Okay. So, um, 1981, this is why I changed. 
I'm going to tell you the exact reason why I changed. Some people think, oh, you just gave your life to you. I, I did. But I want you to know why, what led up to that, okay? Because it's fairly yeah. interesting. Shortened version. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a storyteller, and uh, I like to paint, con paint pictures for people. You know? And uh, so I am 25 years of age. I am in uh, Oakley Psychiatric Hospital in South Auckland uh, for the uh, mentally insane, okay, walking up and down, smoking cigarette. Up the road from that particular ward was a forensic hospital. A forensic hospital is where they put usually people that aren't mad, we go kill people, basically. Okay. They're not mad at all, no. Mm. Well, might, maybe some, but most aren't. So once a week, the male nurses would take our nut ward and the forensic crowd down to the gymnasium to do barbells because we're all young, you see. So when you're young, you can do barbells, play basketball, and you can do this and you can do that and do all sorts of things out there, you see. You know? and, uh, and one day we're all here in the, in the uh, psychiatric hospitals uh, hall gymnasium and a guy got smart to me you see you know? and i didn't like him and i knew from jail days he stared at me and i picked up a chair and i went over to him like this and i was going to smash it right across his head okay and i just knew i was in danger straight away and the male nurse says don't <laughs> i put the chair down put it back in the story but i knew this guy hated my guts I didn't like him at all. So um, back to the ward. Sometime over that eight weeks, I was asleep between two chairs. A lady wrote to me, sent me a letter telling me my own brother, who done 10 years prison in New Zealand, Australia, had found Jesus. Mm. So over those years, I'd met born again Christians. But I felt I was too out there and too bad to be one of them. Difficult, you see. Mm. Never bagged them. I thought, Seems too easy. Just pray a prayer to become a good person. I'm not a good person. So there was the evidence. My own brother. He died last year, actually. And uh, an, an amazing guy. Very different from me. And uh, amazing how, amazing what God does, you know, with different members of the family, you see. So what happened was that um, I wanted to find out whether this conversion was real. So I had to get out of the nut house. The chief psychiatrist, you know what his name was? Dr. Pat Savage. He was the old time shrink, you know, the long white coat, bit of gray hair down there, glass on his nose, big nose, and uh, a little microphone up there. And his way of dealing with the patients would walk around there, you know, and talk to the patients with the microphone out there. So he was a forensic, superintendent of a mental ward and he done it well old school but anyway i did get out i went down the island of new zealand knocked on my brother's door came to the door true mudford style you know <laughs> and uh anyway kind of short for you on that one uh he was on fire for the lord i didn't want to go back to the hospital just in case I got put in the forensic ward up there. That was a, a deterrent to force me through the church doors and his conversion. You see. And some people never change until it's nearly all over. But we need to be out there for those where it's nearly all over. Yeah. You see, yeah. And so um went to church on that Sunday morning. The pastor met me at the door. He said to me, son, if you'll stick around here long enough to get your life changed. I'll keep coming back. <laughs> 41 years, five months later, still rocking up, you know. So what happened was I got prayed for, water baptized, and uh, I joined that particular church. And then David McCracken is a very world famous prophetic man. You may not know of him, but anyway, I do. He's, he's, he's not pathetic, he's prophetic. You know, two different things. You got pathetic and prophetic, okay? And he, he, he's, he's the real due respect, did you see? You know? 
Accountability is important. Right. Getting accountability for your ministry is important. Right. Yeah, man. Uh, because it, it, it'll, it'll carry you, see, you know. It'll, it'll bring essence to what you're doing, you see, you know. Amen. I'm a big believer in it, you know. And look, if I had my way, um, I'd give up what I'm doing and go sit in church somewhere and wreck the joint through my loud voice. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, if I had my way, I'd love to sit in the church week after week and meet the same crowd. But we don't have that luxury. What you've got, you know, to have what you've got, it's, it's luxury. It's actually luxurious, you see. These sorts of meetings and ch you know, churches that, you've, that, that, that you're doing it. You I don't have that, you see. I've got to get ready to go to the next place, in the next place, in the next place. So, um, 1981, the Lord spoke to me through David McCracken, prophet, and the Lord said this to me, my son, my son, <laughs> I've followed you from institution to institution. Tonight, I'm calling you out. I'm going to anoint your tongue, give you a shepherd's crook, and I'll call you to be an evangel, which is sure for evangelist. And you are that one or you are one. <laughs> We're all called to do the work of one. That's wrong, man. It doesn't make you one. A lot of confusion around that area. I hear it all the time. You know, that person is an evangelist and that person, <laughs> but, but, but they're not. They do the work of one. You know, but quiet on that one, but, but I'm, I'm in straight with you. Okay. Uh, the gift on your life um, will be given essence through a lot of people. Mm. Okay. And if, if, if a lot of people are saying that's what you are in your gift, that's probably what you are. Mm. And so knowing your body part, you see, knowing what your gifting is. If you are called to be a five-fold evangelist, then give up your job. <laughs> give it up. Because you're a mobile ministry. You're going to go. Doesn't it stay? No, it doesn't. You know, you listen to me. You know why it doesn't stay? It doesn't stay because the church uh, gets familiar with the gift. And the book says that uh, familiarity breeds content. And the evangelist needs to say, sharp. Listen to me. It needs yeah, to say, right. sharp. And what will blunt in the evangelist gift is trying to be a pastor yeah. or something else out there. Is it? So, where are the evangelists? Number one, my opinion on this. That's all. And uh, the church has muzzled that gift. So they've got discouraged and given up. Well, how come you're doing okay? I'm not doing. I'm doing okay because I, I've been in a long time. I'm not rich at all. I have about twelve people that support me on a monthly basis, <laughs> but I don't put pressure on people for money, and I don't preach for money, and I don't care if I get it when I walk out the door or I don't get it. Okay, that's how much I'm growing. In the early days of my ministry out there, I had big fights with my wife in the car over the, the, the lack of money I was given from a speaking engagement. Uh, big fights. Yeah. Why? Because my trust was in what they gave. Yeah. But then I grew, and I grew, and I grew. One day, God took away my meetings, yeah. which was a source of income to me, you see. What am I going to do now? He says, I'll look after you. Does he pay on Thursday? Not always, but he pays. No shortage of money. <laughs> hallelujah! No shortage of money. He'll pay. He'll make a way. Hallelujah! If you stick with what he's told you to do. Okay. So the evangelists out there. Hallelujah! The devil robs that gift. You know what happens when I go speak in churches? The results evangelism. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah! hallelujah! It's evangelism. Hallelujah! I care. Dead, done. You are. You hang around. You're going to get fired up. You're going to listen. Listen. That's what's going to happen. Hallelujah! I'm going, to, I'm going to remind you of hell. I'm going to remind you of death. I'm going to remind you of the lust out there. You hang around me. That's how I roll. You get in my car. I'm going to get the, the meatiest bit of gospel. You know, I'm going to turn up. Full blast, mate. I'll get you so offended. <laughs> You'll run down the road with, 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 with bug ears, mate. You know? And, uh, and, yeah, come on. You see? That's the result, you see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's how wide. 
you know. Yeah. That's never changed, you see. So um, got saved with the cork in a the bottle. Then I work with street kids. I got a job working for the Salvation Army, and uh, and I had a, had a had about fourteen young married teenagers. We're all into Bob Marley reggae music back in the day. Eighty one, Bob Marley was all around the world out there. All the dark kids were, you know, dreadlocks, ghetto blasters, and reggae music, you know. And uh, so I used to look after them. I used to work with them all week. I got a job. I got a job. I got to help people. So if you get these fourteen young wannabe uh, rasters. And I'm the white hockey, that's what they call me. And I'm listening to uh, uh, Christian music of the, of the day, which was. Uh, yeah, what was it called? Uh, oh, scripture no. and song. Yeah, I'm listening to scripture and song, mm. which is a good song to listen to because it's full of scripture. <laughs> and uh, I'd line them up in the morning. And they'd look at me and I'd look at them. And I'd say, I'm, I'm, I'm the best friend that you've got. Because you're going to go where I've been. But if you listen to me and come where I go, I'll pick you up for church. I didn't invite people to church. I got in the car and went to their houses. The church has forgotten that one. Jesus says, beat the bush. You see, I know the loss. I know the, the, the people out there, young people that are busted out there. So I, I went to their house. I got up an extra hour in the morning, rocked around there in the old bar for went there, you know, and uh, come to the door. And they'd come to the door like this, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, oh, oh, Kevin. Doors open, bro. Church. <laughs> Man. So they couldn't get out of it. We don't see the church doing all that today. We try and rely on a guest speaker. No. You know? So interesting, isn't it? You know, what am I do? So I spent six months in the Kimberleys up there. You talk about a broken heart. If I was to stick it into the, the body of Christ in Australia, I spent six months street preached up there and I never saw one other person do it. Nothing. I started in Catherine and then uh, we went to uh, Katanara. We did uh, Wyndham, we did Hall Creek, uh, Broome, uh, all those places. Lived up there, slept anywhere, slept behind the church, and my shower was this little wee tap. So you kind of strip off when you've got of underwear and get under there, you know, and, and try and have a shower under this little tap there, you know, and, and go like this out there, you know, and you, you know, <laughs> your wife comes up next and, you know, yeah. So I bought this big ghetto blast there, or another one actually, and I went out to where they were, street preached, right at where the Aboriginal people were, you know, not white. And they're out of the desert. So their language is, is not English, it's just desert language. Yeah. But they understood the gospel. They understood Jesus. Yeah. They understood the white guy out there amongst <laughs> that dark community out there that took it all up and down. Up and down. I had a four minute Billy Graham message. Hallelujah. Full blast up there. I mean, no one could give, no one could preach mate about the loss any better than Billy Graham could. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I've got a four minute, he does an invitation. He preaches out there. I got it on a stick and shoved it in up there and turn that thing up loud and walk along there with the cross. Hallelujah. Up on you, turn it around, blast it away. You must be saved. You're like, you know, it's like up and down out there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Fragulous. Oh, I've got to read there. In the back end there. You see? That's how I got the gospel to them. You see? Because Jesus said, go. Yeah. I mean, I lost my truck up there. Took the engine, you know? I'm pretty, I'm loose, but I can be tight too. You know, because God posts Thursday, but not every Thursday. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not on a pension. I'm 67 years of age. I refuse to go on the pension. No. I'm not going to line up at the welfare up there. You know, why? have got too many addresses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you doing when you're rocking there? What's the good say? Now, where do you live? And where do you live before that? 
I'm going to see you later. I'm going to see you for hours, mate, right? How far back do you want to go? <laughs> but no, serious. I'm not knocking the pension. No. Okay. I'm just telling you how I live. And uh, and so um yeah, the truck blew up, B50, you know. Man's the truck, good condition, engine gone. But I've learned this. I've um I've learned this not to be divided. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Not to be divided. They gave me a twenty-three thousand dollar bill. I says, oh, right, 23000 hmm. dollars How long will it take you to fix it? I could take a few months. I said, what do you do with vehicles that you can't fix? They go to the tip. I says, take it to the tip. <laughs> <laughs> I had a second vehicle, the red one out there, you see. God says, use that. So I went all the way, dragged that caravan all the way yeah. down, all the way down, all the way down. I spent 3,000 bucks on it the other day. I had the money to do it. The boss says, cough up. Mm -hmm. I've given you the money. Use the money that I've given you, okay? I'll put more in it. And he did. You know, get tight and want more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad I went to the specialist to get the job done, mate, because he's done a beautiful job. Goes like a taxi now. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> <laughs> Screaming around, bro. Okay, so, um, <laughs> hallelujah. Five minutes and I'll finish. It goes fast, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Look, uh, God took me back to every boy's home. Wasn't it? Every prison, every nut house. Arrived here in Australia 30 years ago. It was a big deal coming over here, man. I've got tats, I've got a record. Travel's not easy. Is that? You know what I did? We had a tiny wee flat in Papatotoe, South Auckland. And I wanted to come to, I so much wanted to come to Australia because. All Kiwis want to come here first, you see. <laughs> this is the next <laughs> land, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, Wonderland. Look at Australia. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so, hallelujah. Um, I got the New Zealand dollars. I went down to the uh, to the bank and I trade, changed my New Zealand dollars into Australian dollars and shoved it up in the ceiling up up here. I put the vision before me. And every couple of weeks, I pull down at these Australian dollars in, in Auckland there. I think, wow, I'm going to go to Australia. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to go, I'm going to go preach in that land, you know. And, uh, and, and then confirmation after confirmation, bang, we came over, arrived in Sydney, bought a second hand car, and started the ministry uh, in Chinchilla, one speaking mm -hmm. engagement. And mm -hmm. God gave me a message for Australia. He said, cut a track where well, there is no track. So I had to pioneer. It's a word we don't like hearing about, you see. Pioneer means work, you know, getting your hands dirty, putting on your work boots, getting out there where you, we, 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 we look to pioneer your ministry, you see. So I came to Australia. I gave passes, heart, heart attacks everywhere. I mean, I was wild. I had big helmets, mate, and studs everywhere. I was a walking Christmas tree, mate, you know. <laughs> Bed, mate, you know, the, the, the whole bike thing out there, and I come up there, up with that door, and the, and the pastor come to the door, and they're, who are you? <laughs> uh, and uh, but you always meet somebody to encourage you, you know. Door slammed shut everywhere. You're not coming here, preacher. You know? I'll preach out here in the streets. Like Whitfield did. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I got AA. I can give my testimony seven nights in the week right here in Brisbane. Without even going in, without even going on the streets, and if I moved to Sydney, I could I, I, I could talk to uh, two thousand alcoholics a week with my story, just by going there where the population is bigger. You see, yeah. But I'm not led by what I see. I'm led by a still quiet voice. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's the key. You see, <laughs> my job is to stir the church up, equip them, send them out. That's our role. Okay, so. Um, Oh, look, we've had every problem you can imagine, you know. Uh, my wife and I have a wonderful marriage. The last year, it's just jumped big time. We rededicated our marriage vows 12 months ago. Yeah. Highly yeah. recommend yeah. it. You were there. You were there. Under the tent. And that was the Lord, because I was wondering what it was going to be like, you know. You get the fuzzy ones, or you, or you, or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> was it just that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I could do it both happy. 
Amen. But I had some rotten floorboards in my life that God wanted to, to remove. You see? Hmm. Very painful ones. And I got myself into a situation that was not good. <laughs> okay. And uh and uh, but 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 I got out of it with the Lord. Amen. 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 And uh um and things changed. Because we've got to die to the flesh. That's right. Amen. Jesus, you know? And I had big issues in my life, you know, massive issues. I was I was a control addict, you know, they come out of prison. Mm. You can be addicted to controlling people. Mm. Right? Mm. And 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 uh, and I, I had to change that, you know. I had to look at different ways of speaking to my wife, you see. Because my only the way I related to my wife was through, you know, the old uh, Colonel Plink and Hogan's heroes. <laughs> and uh, uh, I didn't know any other way. But but the Lord started to teach me and show me, you know. Cool, we lived together in a caravan, like. Not a flash though, just what a very small. So we're never apart. Okay. And so uh God marred us together. It's a miracle, really. Yeah. Absolutely miracle. And my, my wife comes with dysfunctional home also, you see. And when you come to Australia, you give up family. You see. Family die. You can't go back. You see. My wife lost her father with the COVID thing, you see. The, the, Two years, yeah. what's it called? Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, it's big sacrifice, you see. Yeah. Big sacrifice, you see. Yeah. Hard price. Yeah. And so my wife, she had all this stuff, you see. Met me, love is blind, marriage is high, either. And uh, so my wife would be, uh, was people pleasing. See, we've all been a bit, so she'd have a real people pleasing thing going. So she'll tell you this, you know. That's how her, her abuse came out, see? Through pleasing people, trying to, you know, just nice all the time. You know, I hate it. See? Why'd you hate? Because I'm a left wing. <laughs> Get the show on the road. Yes, sir. No, sir. Three birds, full sir, you know. And, and uh, let's go. See? And God put us together, you see. But we have a great time. You know? Work together as a team. So my wife has had to learn. You know, you know I, I've had to too, you see, you know. So, um, so you know, be encouraged, you know, uh, because uh, it's, it's here it is. Um, marriage is, is God's institution to crucify the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Marriage is God's institution to crucify the flesh. But most people aren't honest about it, you see. And I'd been in enough churches that I couldn't hear people talk about their marriages, so I couldn't get any help. See, because mm. people were hiding away mm. that area of the life. You see, that's the biggest test of all that God can take two dysfunctional people and bring them together, and thirty-six years later, still together. And I, we, we, we had a bust up a year ago, and um, and God came in. He says, ten days. You know, I was lost, and uh, but see, God, God came in and. Uh, Got a number. Mm. Mm. Right. We and, uh, and I can tell in this last twelve months, we've probably had I don't know four fights, maybe five louder ones. And just, just <laughs> how honest somebody can get? Okay, if I can get honest, people run out of the room. But that, that, that's good essence for the ministry. Yeah, man. That's all Australians want. Australians like Kiwis, all they want is the real deal. Tell it how it is. If you're going to preach, how does this work out in your life? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's got to it's got to match up with you know. Okay, so so how does that scripture work in your life? How's your week been? Mm. How are you going? How's the day? You know, okay. okay. So I'm big on that, uh, and I learned that in AA. And I learned that in the jail scene too, because you can't walk out. I learned people skills in there. Mm. I learned how to get on with people that, that were pretty nasty. Okay, so uh, almost through. Praise God, finishing. I've got to go to another meeting because I've got to go. Because <clears throat> I've got to go. But but that's okay. Thanks, Hallelujah. Um, I'm just thinking right now, um, one last thing to say, just in case. Um, yeah, just, 
the, the, the Lord's such a wonderful provider. You never go without. Just 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 makes the way and just just does everything out there and as we trust him. Okay, I'll finish on this because I'll, I'll just I'll really finish on this because I want to help you and uh, with what's helped me. Because that's what this is about. It's not about me picking up any money, uh, being a professional preacher. Mm. This is not about me uh, lording it over anybody else. I like to help people. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm going to tell you one preacher, okay, who helped me in this ministry through their teaching and slanting it all. Okay. Mm. And that was uh, Kenneth Hagen Sr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The Mark 11:23 man. Kenneth E. Hagen preached on Mark 11, 22, 23, 24. For 50 years, I won't tell you this, and I'm going to finish. Okay. Okay. Um, why did he help you? He helped me through videos because through their teaching of the time. They taught me about faith. They taught me about the mind. They taught me about the word out there. And a lady came to Brother Hagen one day and, uh, and said to Brother Hagen, Brother Hagen, you know, when he was alive, this says, Brother Hagen, you've been preaching on Mark 11, 22, 23 uh, for 50 years. When are you going to teach us something different? And Brother Hagen said to the dear saint, well, when the church finally gets a hold of this, <laughs> we'll move on to something else. Mark 11, it's, have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be there removed and be there cast into the sea, and shall not doubt this heart, but shall believe that whatever he said shall come to pass, you shall have what you say. Okay. So I'm saying to you that uh, they, that stream of teaching, help build foundation, help teach me faith, uh, help teach me uh, the word of God there. Hallelujah. And really, when it comes down to it all, Romans 12 2 says, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Yes. So they taught me. A